Hello, and welcome to Code Next Door. My name is Andre. Today, we have an interview with the creator of Gleam, Louis Pilfold, in collaboration with Context Free. This is only the first part of the interview, so please go to Context Free's channel and see the second part of the interview, as well as other videos related to programming. Thank you. So well, today we have a guest uh, interview. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Louis Pilfoltz and um, I am the creator of the Gleam programming language, which is a statically typed language that runs on the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, how did Gleam get started? Ah, so oh, that's quite a, quite a number of years ago. It originally started sort of just as curiosity, really. I uh, have always really loved programming languages. I would always try to learn a new one every, you know, few months, a year or so. And um, after a while, I realized that I've got all these compiler adjacent skills because I've been working a lot on static analysis and, and code gen and, and macros and stuff and I realized that if you take all these pieces and piece them together you kind of have a programming language which I found really exciting so I spent uh, a good chunk of a year just sort of like trying to put those things together and see what the experience would like would be like to make uh, my own language and I, I finished that and then I gave a conference talk on it and I sort of put it aside and went back to my job and doing the usual sort of things. And the whole time I had this thought niggling away at the side of my brain asking, well, what would your language look like? What would your ideal language be? And coupled with writing lots of different languages and always wishing that I was using, for example, oh, when I'm writing Elm, I wish I was writing Elixir. When I was writing Elixir, I wish I was writing Elm. I wish I had the best from all of these things. And so I went, okay, let's try and do this. And then, um, it took over a lot of my my free time very quickly, uh, just trying to bring the best of lots of different things together. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Um, working with both Elm and Elixir, uh, it's fascinating to see the languages kind of targeted to users of both those languages. When you were creating your initial draft, did one language steer your language more than another? I think uh it's difficult to say there's definitely a few contenders that are, that are really big in my mind and maybe the three biggest ones would probably be um, elm uh elixir and maybe go um i there was things in each of them i found really admirable in go and elm i really liked how they were designed um i think to be about uh productivity giving you the giving you the smallest um, and making it so you have to give the smallest amount in order to get a lot of productivity in exchange. And I really found that all three of those languages actually would enable me to do things that I would find very challenging in other languages, especially when I was a more junior programmer. Um, so that was really inspirational. And there was a, there was a huge Elm influence at the beginning. So the, the early versions of Gleam had a sort of Elm-like syntax. It looked much more like an ML language. But I had hit, hit upon that point that I think a lot of Elm programmers had where I had a great time bit in the browser and I, I really wish I could write a web service with it. Oh, I really wish I could write a command line app with it. Or I really wish I could write something else with it. And, you know, you ask around, how do you do this? And you get told the answer that you don't. Oh, OK. Uh, I guess my options are give up, use a different language. Well, that's upsetting, isn't it? That's a bit disappointing. Or I try and do some sort of, I do something horrible and hacky and try and trick Elm into doing what I want to. Well, that got a lot harder when they removed native modules. So I, I was sort of defeated there. Or I, I make a, a possibly quite a poor decision in terms of my free time, you know, try and replicate a lot of what Elm has, but in a, in a different world. So a lot of the early stuff was about Elm. And, but as it's grown, um, lots of other languages have started to influence it as well. Like Elixir more and more, and uh, Rust is another one that's been a lot of influence as we've matured. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Um, speaking of Rust, Gleam was first written in Erlang, but now it's in Rust. Could you talk about some of the decisions that led you to that rewrite? Sure. So um, I love I love both languages, by the way. And I, I definitely don't want to say that, you know, Rust is better than Erlang or anything. I think they're just um, suited to different things. Um, so Erlang seemed like the really obvious choice at the beginning because that was probably the language I was using the most at that time and you know if I was just I'm a something programmer it would have been Erlang at that point in time 
and um, I wanted to write something targeted to Erlang virtual machine. So why wouldn't you use Erlang for that? But it was a learning experience. A lot of that early, the first year of compiler development, there was a lots of unanswered questions for me, especially around uh, type system implementation. I've made sort of some toy dynamically typed languages, but I'd never made a statically typed one. So I um, made a lot of mistakes, to, to be honest, and accrued quite a lot of tech debt. And a, a point came in which I realized I had made quite a fundamental mistake in a, in a certain uh, part of the type checker. And I needed to perform a very large refactoring in order to get it back to where it needed to be. I sort of painted myself into a corner and I sort of sat down and thought, I'm not sure I can do it. Like it's, it's it's quite it's quite a complicated system with a lot of uh, a lot of mistakes in it, a lot of tech debt, and it's getting quite hard to work with. So maybe it would be easier to take everything I've learned from this and then just re-implement it again, rewrite it from scratch. I think that would actually be quicker than trying to refactor the the first system and just consider that one a prototype. And at that point, I had an opportunity I didn't have before, which was, oh, I could actually change language here if I wanted to. Is there an advantage to that? And I had to think about why I love Erlang and what I think its strengths are. And I don't think any of those are about um, making a compiler. You know, it's, if I want to make, make a database or a network service or an API or something, yes, let's all use Erlang. But if I want to make a single threaded compiler that's about dispatching on different types of nodes, well, that kind of sounds an awful lot like a statically typed language would provide a lot of value there, especially since I'm going to be um, iterating very quickly on different approaches to to implementing language features and type system features. So I sort of had a scan of all of the um, statically typed languages and eventually settled on Rust. Um, OCaml was like a very close second place, but I decided to go for go for Rust in the end. And yeah, it, it was a little bit of a gamble, but it's really paid off. Um, it has become much easier to make um, very large scale changes within um, the compiler because it's the compiler is mostly a set of data structures and then you know you just transform from one data structure into another so being able to make these you know these data get used everywhere and then they infect the whole system so being able to comfortably make changes to it and it says oh you've got to change here 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 and here that's been tremendously useful and I'm, I'm very happy that the that we made that shift over Oh, and also it's really fast. That's nice. <laughs> Rust is like super fast. Yeah, I love when a compiler is fast. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> uh, speaking though of Rust also, I find that Gleam looks a lot like Rust at a first glance, and it obviously has curly braces. Do you think syntax matters? So I, if you asked me a few years ago, I would have said, no, it doesn't matter. Of course not. Don't be silly. It's all, it's all, it's all just, you get used to it and then it's fine. Um, which, you know, I have changed my mind, which is weird. I'm, I'm a, I'm a programmer and I've changed my mind. How unusual is that? Um, I realized quite quickly that the sort of ML style syntax was off-putting to a lot of people. I would have people say, oh, Gleam sounds really interesting, but, oh, you know, it looks, it looks complicated or it looks weird or oh, it's, it doesn't seem like it's for me because I'm because I'm not a very experienced programmer, or I've only written JavaScript, that kind of thing. And that was really disheartening because the goal of the Gleam project, a large part of it was to make something that was really productive and accessible to everybody. I, I wanted to sort of, you know, copy Elm and Go and enable people who hadn't done, uh, I don't know, for example, multi-threaded programming before to be, enable them to do it. That would be really cool. So the fact people were being turned away was uh, disappointing. So I sort of, started um, trying to design a syntax that was just sort of a, a blend of everything. I wanted it to be a syntax that regardless of whatever mainstream programming language you were familiar with, you would look at it and say, yeah, that sort of looks like what I know. I could probably, I could probably stomach that. Um, but I, I read a, a I've heard a, a term called the strangeness budget, which I unfortunately can't remember who, who, uh, who came up with. I think I read it in a blog or something. And I thought it was just such a fantastic idea, this idea that you've only got a certain amount of weirdness that a person will tolerate. You know, If they look at a really odd syntax, they go, oh, that looks weird. Okay, well, I guess I try it. You know, I'll give it a chance. Well, if, if 
And then if there's a second piece of weirdness, they say, oh, it's too much for me. I'm going to go away. Well, if the first bit of, if the syntax is, is very approachable, they will go, oh, good. And then when they get hit by the second bit of weirdness, whether that be something like a very aggressive type system or the actor model or something else that they've not experienced, they have a lot more time for that. And if people are going to get, if people are going to be challenged by something, I don't want it to be the syntax. I want that to be as workable as possible. So I sort of blended everything together and came up with this new syntax. And um, yeah, it made a much, much larger impact than I thought it would do. I thought it like some people would be, have the most change, but loads of people liked it to the point where with the recent Gleam developer survey, which had about a bit over 200 um, people reply, the number three most um, popular thing, uh, the, the question was, what do you like about Gleam? And the number three thing was the syntax, which I blew my mind. Um, so it does matter. Um, I'm, I'm still slightly bitter about it, but it does matter. Uh, as for Rust, I didn't mean it to look like Rust. That was sort of an accident. I think it's just that using fun, like FN for functions, is like such a Rust looking thing that people see that and think Rust. But I would, I, if anything, I was trying to copy JavaScript a lot more than Rust. OK, makes a lot of sense. Thanks for all that. Uh, in terms of like your community, you mentioned your survey and so on. Uh, Gleam still actually is still new. It's not 1.0 and it, it's still building. Uh, how have you engaged with your community and what kinds of plans do you have going forward in that? So community is really important. You know, you could make a you could make a wonderful compiler or language or runtime system or anything. But if no one's using it, it's sort of slightly pointless, really, isn't it? Um, or at least it is if you're trying to do something like me, you want to make something uh, for use, something that's trying to be practical rather than, you know, research or something like that. So um, just as much work goes into community as, as, as developments. And I think there's quite a lot of answers to this. There's not one single thing you need to do in order to grow a community, um, which is annoying because I'd really like to know what that one thing is and just exclusively do that. But um, I think some things that we've got a lot of mileage out of is just really working very hard to, to foster a very friendly um, community and to try and be very welcoming. And a lot of that, I think, is just leading by example. You know, if you get someone who is um, joining our, our Discord server, um, ha having a Discord server ha helps a lot, actually. Moving from IRC made it um, much, much more popular. But if someone joins, you know, welcome them and say hello. And, and if they ask a question, try and help them. And if they share something, you know, show interest. And if someone makes a pull request, even if that pull request is um, perhaps trivial or um, perhaps not ready to merge, it needs some additional work on it. You know, try and be supportive as that as possible because um, it it does take some additional work. You know, having to to having to be nice that sounds awful, doesn't it? But having to, uh, you know, you you've got to go out of your way to to help people. Uh, but I think it really pays dividends because if they uh, enjoy that, then they start helping people and they start helping people, and hopefully it infects. So the other sides of this, I think, are about having um, a good onboarding experience, having good tutorials and documentation and such that people can go from, oh, I've heard of this Gleam thing because I watched this really cool show, this context-free thing. I really want to see them. I really want to try it myself. How do I, how do I get started? And making it so they can just sort of, um, to, to borrow a term from, from, I think, the Alexa community, you know, that you want to fall into the pit of success. You want it to be, you want the uh, le path of least resistance to be the one to success. So you want them to go to the website, immediately find the exact tutorial that they need in order to do the thing they want to do. So that's something we're lacking a bit at the moment. We've got um, our documentation is much more around, hey, you're a programmer already. Here's just a quick rundown of everything in the language. You know, go get them, Tiger. You can figure out. I really want to make it so you can be guided for the whole process as well. So that's going to be a big thing that I'm focusing on over the next year. So going back to JavaScript, uh, along the way, Gleam has added support for JavaScript output. Uh, does this make Gleam a competitor with Elm and other functional uh, front end languages, or is the focus going to be mainly on the back end? The term competitor is really interesting. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know who I'm competing with really. I think there's a lot of, particularly in the uh, sort of. I think some people in the Erlang and Elixir world think that uh, we're trying to compete with them and take their, I don't know, take their community members or something. But like, I always see it much more as like trying to grow uh, this collective ecosystem. You know, hopefully Gleam can, can pull people into the Beam world that um, 
weren't there before because they're not so into dynamically typed programming. But comparing it to Elm and such is really interesting because we're not even really in the same ecosystem. So I'm not I'm not sure how the relationship works. All I know is that we're very friendly with, with each other, and um, I think I think we want want each other to do well. But in terms of the sort of back end, front end split JavaScript versus Erlang, in terms of like where we run Gleam codes, um, I've always been very focused on on the back end. I, I've um, I do enjoy doing front end stuff. I'm not as good as it as I am at other things, and so I've put a lot of work into making so that you can write web services in in Gleam. I personally think that's a really good use case for the language. Um, but then there's other people. Um, I know a few of them, and a, and a lot of them made themselves known on the uh, developer survey, who um, they only use the JavaScript backend, which I found very surprising. I always thought that it would be people would use the Erlang backend primarily because um, they want types and axes or something like that. And then they would uh, maybe use the JavaScript backend when, they, oh, I want to write a serverless function, or oh, I want a, a widget in a web browser, or I, want, or I want a single page app, that sort of thing. So I thought you would start with the back end, then you'd perhaps move out and do it for other things. But no, some people just 100% JavaScript, which I find, um, yeah, very interesting. And so there's a bunch of people in the community working on front end stuff, a bunch of people in the community working on back end stuff, which includes um, me. And then there's people who just want to write platform agnostic things. They don't care about er um, Erlang and JavaScript. They want to write things that work everywhere. So um, yeah, it's growing in lots of different directions. Thanks for watching this episode of Code Next Door, where we interviewed the creator of Gleam. If you want to see the rest of the interview, you can check it out on the YouTube channel Context Free, where he has the second part of this interview and a lot more programming language related content. Thanks again for watching.